So today we are talking about, um, of course, uh, starting your college career at RPI as a undeclared engineer and the curriculum that you're going to want to follow in the fall semester. Um, I am sharing a PowerPoint right now um, that will kind of help me stay on topic as we go through this. Um, so, you know, as I as I have uh, said to you guys throughout and how I'll continue to say it to you, um, as an undeclared engineer, it's a very broad, general um, kind of explanation to get started. Um, I'll always encourage you to meet with me one on one. And I've had some great one on one meetings so far in the last couple weeks. Um, I also encourage you to take advantage of the other major specific webinars, especially if you have an idea of like one or two majors that you're really, really interested in. Um, the more information, the better to inform your fall semester. And then at the end of all that, when you're on information overload, you can always come back to me and we will um, we'll kind of break down all that information together to create a fall schedule for you. Um, so just to start off, you should start to be really familiar with me. So I'm Kristen Bergen. I'm your academic advisor for undeclared engineering. Um, I am born and raised in Cooperstown, New York, so I'm pretty local to the Albany area, and I live in Troy right now. Um, so I'm very familiar with Troy and where you're going to be coming this fall semester, so I can kind of guide you in more than just academics, but I can I can tell you what's going on around here. Um, the capital region uh, in New York is super cool. Um, you know, we have our city areas, we have our urban areas, um, we have our arts and our musics and our theaters, which of course is a little bit different right now with COVID, um, but we also are really close to the mountains and hiking trails, which you can take full advantage of when you're here in the fall. Um, that being said, uh, I'm, you know, on a personal level, I love to read, I love to write, I'm an artist, I have two cats. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, um, I'm currently reading, um, the new book, uh, by Philip Pullman, who is the man who wrote The Golden Compass, some of you might know, um, and I'm absolutely loving it. It's called, I think, Into the Dust or something like that. Anyway, uh, I always want you to make sure that you feel really comfortable with me, so I throw in antidotes and also get a little awkward every once in a while introducing myself. Um, but I think it's important because um, you're going to have me as that number one connection for you on campus right now while you are um, getting set up. Um, and you can come to me with questions for everything. Yes, I'm an academic advisor. No, I don't know anything about housing. However, I do know ResLife and I know the staff in ResLife. So you can even direct those kind of questions to me if you um, want to want to start with me. Okay. So today, this is what we're going to go through. We're going to start with academic advising in the School of Engineering. Um, we are going to talk about, of course, your fall schedule, so your fall curriculum. Um, as an undeclared engineer, uh, we're going to talk about some registration resources. These are definitely going to be familiar as you've gone through the registration guide. Um, I'm just wanting to help you um, kind of connect to the ones that you definitely want to know about in the next week. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to leave all the time for questions. Um, as I kind of warned you, um, I would give you that time. So that way, if you did have questions and you, and you wanted to make sure you were prepared for that, um, we'll be getting to that at the end. All right. So every school at Rensselaer does approach academic advising a little bit different. Every school does have a hub like we are the hub in the School of Engineering. Um, however, how the hub works and serves their student populations does, um, does differ. Um, and it's typically based on the population and how the faculty, um, what that faculty role is um, in, in um, in advising. So in the School of Engineering, this might be familiar to you already, but we really like to go over it. Oh, wrong way. Um, as a first year, your main primary source of academic advising is going to be in the hub. So that's going to be me. Um, what's special for you as an undeclared engineer is that you get me. 
Um, but you also can talk to any of the other hub advisors um, as you're trying to decide what major you want to declare. Um, this can be really useful as you're getting to learn curriculums. Um, so, you know, a huge part of choosing your major is, am I going to want to study for the, or take these classes and study this for the next four years or not? They can talk to you about those upper level courses. Um, the other, you know, unique thing as an undeclared engineer is when you declare, you'll actually get a new academic advisor um, in the hub. Even if, um, you know, so you don't have to declare until you're a sophomore. So even if you decide to hold on to that undeclared engineering major until you're a sophomore, even then your first stop will be a SOE hub advisor to get you set up um, with your, what we call your four year plan, which is um, the curriculum plan that's gonna be unique for you and your plan of study. Um, you'll still, you know, start with that hub advisor before going to a faculty advisor. Um, we do have a really collaborative relationship with the faculty advisors so how we how we look at it is you know we're basically getting you started as you transition into college so by the time you leave us you'll have a really good idea of you know how to make a schedule where you can look to figure out what classes you should be taking um you will have that four-year plan so you'll always have something to refer to when you're trying to figure out what your requirements are um and of course all the resources that are across campus we'll, we'll make sure you feel really comfortable with that um this is done through something uh we call the hidden curriculum which i'll be sending you more about once we get through registration um, your faculty advisors for that bigger picture and you know arguably more exciting stuff like connecting your education to your career goals so internships research co-ops um, connecting with alumni uh, although we do we will do that with the industry hour this fall semester um, you know you can talk to them when you're interested in studying abroad and kind of the connections that they might have internationally um, and of course arch planning so like I said, big picture, big picture stuff compared to, uh, you know, let's let's get you grounded, let's get your feet under you, and make sure that you feel like you know what you're doing as a college student. All right, so this is the team. So as I said, you are welcome to chat with any of the ladies that you see here in this picture. Um, at the bottom, you can see who is advising what major. Um, we try to group them with similarities, as you'll see. Um, Marie with the nuke and arrow and Karen with the civil and environmental and then you have Kara on the end who does ECSE with electrical and computer systems engineering. Um, you know, right now they are doing major specific video chats for, for their majors. A, this is all going to be the same. You're going to get all this general content, but you will hear kind of what the next part is um, about the major specific planning so that you can kind of take in um, their thoughts and opinions on those specific majors. So as I'll say over and over again, when we talk on declared, we're talking very generally. Um, you know, everything I'm about to talk to or show you is something um, these classes are required for every single major in engineering. Um, however, you know, if you were going to be a biomed major, you might look at that first semester a little bit differently. Um, so if you're really thinking biomed, it might be worth it to listen to what Val has to say and then make an appointment with me so that we can create that unique schedule for you. Um, you know, for example, just to throw it out there with electrical and computer systems, you might want to make sure that computer science is on your list um, of classes that you want to take this fall, even though you don't see it in the in the typical semester. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But anyway, this is this is the team. This is the hub. All right. So right now we know this meeting is um, about your fall registration. So this is kind of where you're at in the progress of that. Um, Step one is the registration guide and this video chat. So you're doing that right now. Um, the next step is going to be that one-on-one -on -one appointment that I'm going to keep pushing to you as an undeclared engineer. Um, again, some of you might look at that standard schedule as an un undeclared engineer and go, yep, nope, that's perfect. I'm not bringing any AP credits in. I'm still making a decision. Or I've looked at the majors I'm interested in and these are all the classes they need. So this is a solid choice for me. Honestly, that might be a good portion of you. Um, but some of you might be thinking, you know, I think I need a little bit more, um, you know, uh, computer systems in my schedule and how do I do that? That's where I'd say make an appointment with me and we can chat about it. Um, after 
one-on-one -on -one appointments after you actually register for your classes. Um, we're going to do our student orientation, so that's going to be um, mid-August. You'll do that with us in the SOE Hub. Um, we're going to go over the next bit of uh, information you need to feel successful in your fall semester. That will include the hidden curriculum, um, and it will be in this exact WebEx room. So if you have this link, you basically always have access to me. Um, so there you go. <laughs> Okay, curriculum planning for fall 2020. Let's get started. Um, so for just a couple minutes, I'm gonna talk about AP and other transfer credits. Um, I always get a lot of questions about this, so don't hesitate to start writing those questions down. Um, you know, for those of you who don't have AP and other tra transfer credits right now, I am gonna cover stuff that will be useful to you if in the future you decide you do wanna transfer in credits. A lot of students choose to do this the summer between their freshman and sophomore year. Um, so there, I, I promise there's good info in, for, er, in here for you as well. All right, so our first check mark here offers the question, should you apply your transfer credits? Um, so you had to get a five in order to bring in a or a credit if it was an AP exam. Um, and this means that you are pretty much exactly where you would wanna be in order to move to the next level. You know, for example, if you're gonna bring in Calculus 1 credit, you should feel really secure about moving on to Calculus 2. Of course, there are some um, students who do want to take Calculus 1 because it is something they're comfortable with, something they're familiar with, and they use it as a way to learn how to learn at RPI and learn as a college student. Um, that, of course, is, is an option. Um, as is moving forward if you get that five. Um, I think this is a very personal choice and there are pros and cons to both sides of bringing in credits or deciding not to. Um, this could be something that you wanna talk to me one-on-one -on -one about um, and we can do that. Um, but I'll say baseline, when you sit down to register, whatever choice you make, so if you do decide to move up to Calculus 2, um, you know, you might get a week into that class and realize, actually, I really think I want to be in Calculus 1. Um, we can make that switch. So even into the first two weeks of the semester, we can still make adjustments to your schedule to make sure that you have something that you feel good about. Um, so if you go into Calculus 1 and you're like, oh, man, this isn't challenging enough, we can put you in Calculus 2. So just keep that in mind. Um, you want to always make sure that your transfer credits are, are going to be applied. So this is something I don't need or you don't have to stress about right now, um, but it is something I want to have on your radar. So it's very likely just because of the state of the world right now that your credits will not be applied before you go to register. Um, so you can see the honor system is kind of what we're working with here. And I'll tell you every summer, or yeah, every summer there's a reason why credits are not in there before you do your first registration. So this honor system is something we're very, very used to working with. Um, what this means is that they will not have prerequisites turned on when you go to register. So you don't have to have calculus one on your transcript in order to register for Calculus 2. Um, this also works the other way around where they will look <laughs> to make sure that credits are there um, as we go into the spring semester. So you wanna double check that all of that comes through because if it doesn't, it means that you might have to go back and either resend all your information again. It might mean that you actually need to take Calculus 1 if you move on to Calculus 2. Um, the good news is when you and I meet in the fall semester, because we will definitely meet in the fall, it's something that I look for in every meeting. Um, but if you are kind of keeping an eye on it by looking at your transcript, you could get a head start on that, um, which is important. It's important to know what you've accomplished so far. Um, so then the final check mark here, our add deadline and our drop deadline, that's that's pretty much what I've been referring to about how there's flexibility in your in creating your schedule. Um, so again, the ad deadline is in the first two weeks of classes and you can switch sections. You can um, drop something and add something else. Um, you know, throughout the summer, uh, students will make friends in other sections. Yes, you can absolutely move into those sections with your friends. That's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a really good reason to switch sections because study groups are a great way to get through um, tougher courses. Um, and then the drop deadline, after the add deadline, you can't add courses anymore, but the drop deadline will allow you to drop courses um, and it's like it never happened. So, you know, if you do 
you know, get into Calculus 2 and it just totally backfires in a way that you weren't expecting, we drop it and we start again in the spring semester. Um, I will always refer to strategic planning. Um, strategic planning to me is making sure that we are making choices about your schedule and your curriculum that put you in the best possible situation. So the ad deadline and the drop deadline are definitely parts of it. Um, and I do strategic planning pretty much all day long with undeclared engineers as we try to find the right schedule for you um, and find, you know, the classes that you're truly interested in. So sometimes we drop a class just because it's not going to do anything for a major that you want to choose. Um, and we don't need it to take up time in your schedule when we could be focusing on something that's going to really impact the major you want to be. Um, so that's that's a good summary of the add and drop deadline. All right. So, oh, shoot. I forgot. So <laughs> going to the piece that's definitely going to be helpful for everyone if you want to bring in transfer credits, um, please make sure that you're looking at the registration guide when um, you're trying to figure out how to bring credits in. You're going to see two forms. So one is the high school certification form. So that form is going to um, basically be signed from your either principal or guidance counselor. And it's going to say that the classes you took when you were in high school did not get applied to your diploma. If they were applied to your diploma, they've already been used, so we can't use them at RPI. Um, and the other form is called the transfer um, credit approval form. This form is one that you will use throughout your time at RPI if you bring want to bring classes to RPI, and it's basically ensuring that every credit that you try to bring in will actually transfer to RPI. Um, you need my signature on it, so you know that tells you that I'm here to help you with that form. Um, so as you're going through that process, don't don't be shy. If you have questions, we can kind of work on those forms together. All right. Moving on. <laughs> All right, what about Haas? So I will tell you that the number one question I always get usually has something to do with Haas and Haas courses and Haas requirements. Um, don't feel like you can ask me too many questions about Haas um, because, you know, I think that your engineering degree is pretty straightforward and it's why you came to RPI. So the Haas stuff usually gets put on the back burner a little bit. Um, we have some awesome Haas courses um, and some awesome Haas pathways. So I think once you get engaged with it, it'll make a lot more sense to you. Um, and it's something that we're going to talk about more in depth um, during the SO portion and much, much more when you're actually on campus in the fall. Um, so this is a really brief breakdown. Um, the stars are next to the stuff that you need to pay attention to for your first registration. So that registration that begins um, on July 13th. So overall, you have 20 credits of Haas, which breaks down to five courses. Um, three of those courses are going to be a Haas pathway. Um, and that Haas pathway may also include your Haas inquiry course and your communication intensive course. Um, so one class can actually do a lot of good for you. Um, if, if, this is, if this is a little bit confusing, um, reach out to me after this, this webinar and I, can, I have a worksheet that I can share with you. Um, it's not something I've shared yet because I don't want to overwhelm you with information. Um, so if you do, you know, sit down to do your registration and you focus on that Haas inquiry, so the IHSS, and you focus on finding something communication intensive, you're already going to be doing the right thing. Um, the Haas pathway is something that you're going to have to choose, um, and it's very likely that your IHSS course is going to be the first in the pathway. So it's nice if you can kind of pick a pathway before you choose. However, I understand, you know, sometimes the topics of the Haas courses just sound way interesting. And, and if you want to go that route and then we pick your Haas pathway based on the IHSS, I totally get that, too. Um, OK. So I'm going to move on. Oh, and going back to the transfer stuff, you can only transfer in up to eight Haas classes. So what this means is like two AP classes, or if you did something at a community college, we can only do two of those. Um, if you think you're going to have more than two Haas courses, they get applied to something else. They're applied to what we call a free elective, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Okay. All right, so let's talk about your fall schedule. <laughs> Okay, so this should look really familiar to you. This is your undeclared uh, curriculum template. So 
Um, if you watch the video, you know that this is 100% modeled off of a major template so that when you get a major template, you have a pretty solid idea of how to read that document um, because that's what all, all, all the students who have declared something, that's what they're working off right now. Um, so as an undeclared engineer, there is a super crucial, super important course. It is Engineering 1700, um, Introduction to a Better World Engineering. So this is the class where every single Monday afternoon, um, this semester it's going to be online, which is actually really kind of nice because then you can grab yourself a bag of popcorn, get all comfortable in your dorm room, um, and just sit back and, and get some information on the majors you're interested in. Um, but Every Monday afternoon, you're going to be introduced to um, uh, one of the engineering majors at RPI. So, for example, you will have Professor Anderson come in and he will talk to you about aero, you know, aeronautical engineering. Um, he'll be there to answer all your questions. So if you do have questions about like the aerospace major that's up and coming, you can talk to him about that. Um, they're going to go from, you know, curriculum uh, to research to exactly what is in the title of this class better world engineering. So they're going to talk about how aerospace and aeronautical engineering are making a really positive impact. Um, and they're also going to talk about where air engineering went wrong, um, which is important because you guys are, you, you guys are the future, right? We've heard that. Um, and you guys are going to be designing the new, um, the new, uh, tools that are going to be used in all these fields. Um, so, how do we not repeat the mistakes of the past and create something even more epic in the future? Um, so th that's basically what each week you're going to go over for each of the different majors. Um, and then hopefully you're familiar with industry hour. So industry hour is still going to follow Better World for Engineering. Um, that class ends at 450. Better or industry hour is going to start right at five. Um, and that's the program where not only will we have the career center involved to talk to you about the statistics of the major that you just learned about. So, you know, where do RPI students get jobs when they've graduated with this major? What um, what do they get paid when they do co-ops in that major? What is their starting salary in that major? Um, and they'll also go in a little bit deeper with how you can, you know, find your major. So there's a lot of resources in the Career Center that you can use for that. Um, after the Career Center speaks, that's when we get our alumni back. So our alumni are going to talk to you about their day-to-day -day in each of these jobs. So you will hear from people who work at NASA right now. Um, you know, for example, with the, <laughs> the aerospace, actually biomed too. We have some biomed alumni who work in aero or at NASA. Um, but you know, they'll talk to you about the day-to-day -day of their jobs. They'll answer your questions about, you know, additional education or what kind of internships you should be looking for. Or if there's research or a certain faculty member that you really want to make a connection with while you're at RPI. Um, and we're also going to get current students who've done internships and co-ops so they can kind of navigate you through that process too. And also, I think it's really important to meet upperclassmen because they've done what you're about to do. So they can give you some of the best advice about planning your schedule. Um, and again, the, the great faculty that you want to build relationships with. So that is the crucial course. That's Engineering 1700. So you're going to get a lot out of that as an undeclared engineer. Um, and even if you think you know what you want to declare, some of the important stuff that some students don't think about is that every week you're going to meet uh, faculty from every single engineering department. Even if you are an aeronautical engineer, you might want to do research with biomedical engineering. This is a way that you can meet those faculty to kind of broaden your relationships across the School of Engineering. Um, and that's definitely an awesome thing. So this is a really unique opportunity that you get as, you know, um, undeclared engineers. You're the only group of students that we put this class down in front of um, as you start. So I would encourage you to take advantage of it for sure. Um, so then, of course, we have our math and science core. So hopefully this is all really familiar to you. Um, and I believe, yeah, I go, I go into this deeper in the next slide. Um, so your math and science core, and then, of course, Haas, which we've already talked about. So use this guide um, to kind of help navigate what you should be doing this, this fall. Um, like I said, that fall semester is awesome because every single class you see there is needed um, or utilized by every single engineering major. So it's no shock that you need to take physics, right, or calculus. Those are really important as, as an engineer. Um, 
Haas is great while you're undecided and as a first year because it is four credits that you need um, that aren't another heavy math, science, or engineering course. Um, and then some of the stuff in later semesters, like if you look at the spring semester, there's stuff in there that you'll see in the fall semester on major templates, but we put in in the spring because there's no real rush to get to it. And, you know, it there's other stuff in the fall semester that might help you kind of, again, put your feet under you and to make you feel more academically um, confident as you go into those courses. For example, I'm sure you've all heard me talk about um, taking physics one before IEA at this point. Um, the orange is some of my favorite stuff on the schedule. The orange are all those uh, one credit exploratory courses. Um, so keep in mind that the first four, so engineering processes, IME, material science, and chemical engineering, um, those are the ones you can take this fall. And then the rest of them, you'll have to wait to the spring, which is fine. We don't have to stress about that right now. Um, and keep in mind that if you are interested in material science or chemical engineering, if you don't take it this fall semester, you're going to have to wait till next fall. The great thing about these one credit courses um, in orange is that they are truly seminar courses, so they're not going to be super work intensive. They're really there to help you learn about these majors. Um, and if you do declare one of these majors, they're also a requirement for the majors. So you are checking off something that you need to do. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Ooh. All right, so for your math classes, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but an important point that I want to make, so is after you get through Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, you'll see that the option we give you is Math 2400, which is uh, differential equations. So the reason why you see differential equations here and not multivariable calculus, which you might remember me saying in the guide, is because multivariable calculus is not actually a requirement for every single engineering major. Um, so as often as I can, I try to save you from something that you don't necessarily need to take. Um, however, if you are that far along in your credits and you, um, you are looking at a major that does require multivariable calculus, of course you could take that in the fall semester. Um, and actually, for a lot of students, I might even encourage that you take that multivariable calculus because it's kind of nice. It goes Calc 1, Calc 2, and then multivariable calculus is really considered Calculus 3. Um, however, differential equations is the class that is required by all engineering majors, and it is because it's a prerequisite or co-requisite for some major um, first engineering courses. So you really need that class before you can move into your engineering curriculum. A lot of times it doesn't make that big of a difference in your fall semester. Um, but remember, if you're bringing in a lot of credits, you might get to those engineering courses faster. So it's something to think about. Um, for your science course, you're going to see physics, which we all know is important, chemistry, and physics too. You don't see biology here. Um, biology, again, is not a requirement for every engineering degree. Um, it is an option in some of them. So again, depending upon the majors you're interested in, it's something we could talk about. And if it makes sense for you, then absolutely, that's that's a choice that we'll make. Um, and then your four credit engineering course you can see here is um, I, oh, IEA. Sorry, I keep having a notification pop up. Um, is IEA. So IEA is Engineering 1100. It's Introduction to Engineering Analysis. Again, you don't really want to consider this until after you've finished Physics 1. Um, or unless you are interested in civil engineering, there could be um, a good argument to put uh, engineering analysis in your first to your fall semester. Um, if you are someone who's considering civil engineering, I actually encourage you to make an appointment with, with me because there's a few things you might want to consider for your fall semester, um, kind of along the lines of uh, ECSE with computer science. All right, we've discussed Haas. So again, you're going to be looking for that IHSS and that communication intensive. And we've talked about those exploratory courses. Um, so hopefully you feel really good about this. You know, this is kind of the essence of what we're talking about right now. Um, so if any questions, just let me know. Um, this, this is what I want to make sure you feel good about. All right. 
Registration begins on July 13th, so we're only a few weeks away. Um, so I want to make sure you know how you're, you can have a successful registration. So first and foremost, you're going to want to check your time ticket and set a reminder for that day and time. So you're not going to get a time ticket until the week of July 6th. So if you look now, it's not going to be there. Um, but uh, in the week of July 6th, when you find out, really, truly set a notification on your phone, put it on your calendar, um, and the moment your time ticket open up, opens up, you're going to want to sit down and register. Remember, every hour, more students are going to be allowed to register for their courses, so that's going to be everyone in the first year class. Um, we have almost a thousand engineering students, so if you think about that, um, you know, all of you guys are going to be headed for Calculus 1 and uh, physics one. Now, I'm not saying this to scare any of you because there's definitely room for everyone, um, but you want to make sure that you you don't wait to the last minute and then you have a really tough time putting classes together. Of course, I'm here to help with that, so if that does happen to you, just reach out to me and make an appointment. Um, but save yourself the hassle and just the second you can register, just sit down and do it. Um, you're going to want a plan A, B, C, D, E, um, and that is how I will always feel and what I will always suggest. Yaks and uh, Quacks, if you got my other email, those are both really good tools to find multiple sections and multiple plans for schedules. Um, so you shouldn't have any trouble creating um, a few different schedules that will work well for you. Um, and, you know, if you go to sit down and you discover that a section is full, keep it simple and just move to plan B. Um, don't worry too much or stress too much. Um, every semester it's very likely that at least one or two of your plan A's aren't going to work out. Um, that's just part of the territory. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. So registration challenges. So I kind of alluded to this. So classes might be full. They might be restricted to a certain major. They might have prereqs and corecs that you need, um, or you're asked to join a wait list. So for all of this, I would say immediately move to plan B, make sure you're registered for something um, as close to your time ticket as you can. Um, but in all of these situations, there are alternatives. So just because a class is full or restricted to a certain major, it doesn't mean we can't get you into that class that you're interested in. Um, a golden rule is that faculty have the final say. So if they say yes, it means yes. And if they say no, it means no. Um, Sometimes over the summer, students are in a class and they'll drop that class because another class opened up that they wanted. Um, that means you can take that seat and get into that section. Um, and sometimes this happens in the first day, the first week of classes. So whatever happens when you go to register in July, it doesn't mean your plan A is not going to work out. It might just mean it works out in September, which is perfectly fine, you know, as long as you get into those classes. Um, and I totally understand the wanting to be a planner and knowing what's headed your way. I am, I am that too. And you know, it's real. It's a real genuine engineer way of thinking. Um, but we, we kind of roll with the, pin, the, the punches. And let me know how I can help you with that. If you're asked to join a waitlist, absolutely say yes, especially if it's something you want to be in. Um, you will get an email that will tell you if your number in the waitlist has come up and you have the option to join the class. Um, you don't want to miss that email. So starting now, make sure you're checking your RPI email every day and responding to emails um, just so you don't miss the important stuff. All right, some more registration challenges. Um, you may get locked out of SIS. You may not receive a time ticket. It doesn't happen often, but it happens every once in a while. Remember, you're not gonna get them till July 6th though, so don't worry yet. Um, or class says that you need a prereq that you have, um, but for some reason it's not registering it. Well, for that one, maybe it hasn't come in yet, which is a good sign. Um, to check your transcript to make sure if it's there or not. Um, if it is there, and you know, if you didn't get a time ticket or if you're locked out of SIS, this is the email address you're going to want to reach out to. Um, you know, I'm always here to help, and I, I do want to help you when I can, but in these cases, I would say cut out the middleman and just go straight to the person who can fix it. Um, so it's newstudentreg at rpi.edu, um, and I'll make sure you have this, this email address as we get closer to registration too. Right. Registration resources. <laughs> All right. So first and foremost, the registration guides, you know, um, 
let me, I'm clicking on this link and I want to make sure that I'm actually sharing that with you. Okay. Whoop. Okay. If anyone can't see the website, make sure you let me know in the chat. I'll be able to see it if it comes up. Um, so the registration guide should look super, super familiar to you. Remember right here, you have access to all of the registration guides. So again, if you're interested in maybe one or two majors, you might want to click on them and just kind of take a peek. Um, they are set up the exact same way as the undeclared engineering guides. I should know. I helped go through them <laughs> a million times before we sent them out to you. Um, but of course, where they're different is that you will get some information on major templates. Um, and you will also see what it is like to plan your fall schedule. Of course, it's going to pause loading right here. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. All right, so this is my colleague Val, who's the advisor for Biomed. So if we come down, you'll see um, right here is a section that you don't have in the undeclared guide, which is major templates. You can learn more about those. You will see the major template for biomed engineering or whatever you click on. And right there, you can see what is the proposed um, schedule for the fall semester. So you can see where those differences are, right? Like calculus being, or uh, physics being in the, the fall or spring semester. You'll see IEA being in the fall semester. You see CAD here. Um, so those are differences that you and I can talk about. And of course, there, your schedule for fall 2020 is going to be a little bit different. So in this video, Val will explain why these are the courses that are recommended to you as a biomedical engineer. Um, so keep in mind that you can use all of these. And I am used to, I have put up to five or more major templates together when planning one semester with a student. So don't feel like it's going to be too much for me to help you navigate if you're one of those students who really is interested in everything. Um, okay, going back to our slideshow, uh, YAKS and QUACS. I've sent emails out about both of them. I know YAKS hasn't been loading for everyone recently. Let's see if it loads for me right now. It looks like it's maybe loading. YAKS works very, very similar to YAKS. Um, I said QUACS, right? It's too confusing. Uh, so Yaks and Quacks are both made by student organizations, if you can't tell. Um, and I think that's awesome because no one knows better than what you guys need when you go to register than fellow students. Um, so it looks like it's not loading. But in your registration guides, we have that whole section about Yaks. Um, and of course, Quacks is going to be a little bit different. Um, but if you look at this guide and you kind of learn the basics of the scheduling um, platform, you should be able to register for your classes pretty easily. Um, and this is something that uh, you and I can work on together. Um, you know, if you make an appointment with me, we can pull up Yaks and kind of go through how to plan a nice schedule together. Um, yeah, so that's not working, which I, I know they're updating it right now for your registration. Um, so that might be what's happening, or it could be my Wi-Fi. All right, so here's here's Quacks. So it looks, if Yax came up, you would see that it looks a little bit similar, but you can see the breakdown in the classes. Um, so for example, we can find, you know, your engineering courses here pretty easily. So if we go into core engineering, um, we will see like right here is engineering 1700. Um, the only reason this is crossed out is because I was building a schedule on it earlier. So um, I think if we come over here, you'll see I, I put together some classes. So um, up here, you'll see how many variations of a schedule you can have. So if we scroll to the bottom, we'll see I picked chemistry and foundations of engineering and documentary film. And there's nine different schedules. So if you click through like this, this is what I mean by finding your plan A, your plan B, and your plan C. Um, YAX works very, very similar. You'll see there's a schedule here. So if I had classes picked, that's what you would see here. So you can type in up here, and maybe if I do this, something will come up. Maybe not. I don't know if I want to spend too much time here. Yeah, so we'll move on. Um, CIS 
is your student information system. So that's where you're actually going to go to register. Um, you know, in the student menu, you will see, um, you can look at the class search right now to find specific classes. Um, when you go to look for your time ticket, you're going to click on register, add or drop. Um, and again, all of this stuff is in the registration guide, so you can always refer to that if you forget what I've said. Um, and you know, you can always email me. And then of course, the final note on here is your academic advisor. So, uh, I will say it over and over again, please don't be shy if you have any questions or if you need me. This is exactly what I'm here for. Even if you know I'm not going to know the answer, it doesn't mean I can't help you find an answer. Um, and you know, you guys have um, enough to think about when you are trying to figure out what the right direction is for you in engineering. So let me take on the stress of all, all of the things that you need to figure out. Um, so make an appointment with me, send me an email, I'm here to help. Okay. All right, next one, we are gonna do time for questions. So, I'm going to give everyone a minute or two, of course, to type in questions. I haven't really looked in the chat since we've begun, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Um, okay, so I will give everyone a couple minutes to type in any questions that you might have. Think about when you went through the registra registration guide, if there was anything that you um, were uncertain of, and yeah. <laughs> Okay, let me make my chat a little bigger here. All right, so what if there's no communication intensive Haas course offered for a minor you're interested in? Well, that definitely does happen. Um, what can you quickly type in what minor you're interested in and I'll, I'll I, I can see if I can give you a little more information on that. Um, the great thing with Haas is that you have five classes that you need to take, right? So three of them are definitely going to be for your pathway. And for a minor, you need one more class. So there's still always one class to kind of help make up for anything that you're missing in regards to your requirements. So it, I wouldn't stress about not doing a communication intensive or not having a communication intensive as part of a pathway or a minor you're interested in. Most of them have it. Okay, so you say psychology. So psychology um, is, so there's actually an upper level communication intensive course. So if that's the, the direction that you're thinking you wanna go in, of course you wouldn't be able to do communication intensive in, in your first year, but you could later down the road. Um, so the reason why the communication intensive requirement is part of your first three semesters is because, you know, a lot of times seniors would get to their communication intensive class in their very last semester. Um, and then they would realize, wow, this is super helpful. And I could have used this, like how to write a report or how to do a presentation throughout my four years of college. Um, so we're really pushing that communication intensive early, but it's because it really does help you. Um, so in the case of psychology, which it is upper level courses, um, what I might say is you really do need to do an IHS and IHSS in your first semester. Um, so you might just choose to do that Haas inquiry um, as a communication intensive in your first semester to totally just get rid of those two requirements and then the rest of your classes can be all psychology. Because um, there's actually no Haas inquiry course in the psychology pathway either. Um, it's a very unique <laughs> situation, but happy, happy to talk to you more about that too. All right, next question. Um, what is the difference between the acts and quacks? That is a really good question. Um, and up until, well, I exclusively have used yaks up until this summer. Um, I think there's something happening with the update in yaks that I don't fully understand that have made it a little bit tougher um, to get the page to load. Uh, I think I think people using Firefox have had more luck with it. I have Chrome set up on my computer, so um, I didn't I didn't go through that today. But really, truly. Um, I think the main difference that people would say is that Yaks is a little bit more um, maybe pretty 
and more user friendly, but they're essentially the exact same thing. They both do um, a really good job in making planning your schedule a little bit easier. Um, because if you don't use yaks and quacks, you're pretty much going to the literal drawing bar board with a pen and paper. Um, so if you do, if you go to use them and you're a little confused, the first time you do anything, you you have to have questions about it. So don't don't feel like you should know something. Um, so if you do have a little trouble using these tools, that's something you can make an appointment with me and we could talk about together. Um, I there's there's a learning curve anytime you do something new. Okay, do transfer credits count towards the amount needed to graduate? Yes. Yes and no. Mostly yes. Um, so if you're transferring credits in, um, you can bring in a certain number of credits for each of the different cores. So we can go in a little bit more um, in depth for that if you're someone who's thinking you're going to bring over 32 credits. Um, for example, you know, we talked earlier about Haas. You can only bring in eight credits of Haas. Um, so if you're bringing in like 12 credits and eight of them are Haas, the rest of those credits would be going towards free electives. Um, and all of that helps you with graduation. Um, free electives are things that are not specifically required by your major. So it could be something like um, an environmental engineering um, exam that you did, or you know, you could have taken uh, an engineering course at a community college and it, it'll come to RPI as an engineering elective. So not specific to any majors, but you know, still a nice engineering credit. Um, so they, they certainly can help you with uh, what you need to graduate. So that's why students, I think, typically want to bring them in um, so that either they can, you know, fit in an extra study abroad semester or take a semester off to do another internship or co-op. Um, some students want to start a master's program early or graduate a little bit early. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to bring in credits. And I think that's one of the reasons why students after their freshman year of college look into doing summer classes because it can give you a little bit of a leg up as you start your sophomore level classes too all stuff that we can talk about and you do not need to make a decision on the next summer's classes until at least the spring semester but we can talk about all of that um does rpi take the clep exams that is a great question and i actually don't have an answer for it um so what i'll say is why don't you email me and i'll i'll look into it for you and if anyone else has that question too email me and and we'll figure it out off the top of my head i don't recall seeing any brought in um but there's no reason not to ask right because <laughs> they, they might well they might as well um allow that all right uh, where can I find the required forms for the AP transfer credit approval? So for APs, you there's no form for it. You're just going to send it through the College Board. Um, so you'll have the College Board send it right to RPI. So they, I think they can do um, like snail mail or email. Um, right now, email is obviously I, ideal, but it, I, people are definitely checking the mail on campus, even if we're all working remotely. Um, so don't worry about that too much. The forms are for if you do like a uh, like a, an extra like I know there's dual enrollments or you go to a community college for an extra course or something like that. Um, and those are in the registration guide in the AP section. So if you just look through there and actually the AP section will tell you in the registration guide will tell you exactly when and why and how you need each of those forms too. Um, okay. The document for AP credits says U.S. History maps to SSH 4100. Is that a single course or a group of courses? So it's going to be one course. Um, and that's actually interesting. I haven't looked at those what they're coming in as um, in a while. Uh, but so basically that's saying that it's coming in as it's. I think there's might be a T missing in there an ST. S H. Um, so if it's coming in as that course, it, it is a Haas course, which is really convenient um, because it could be part of a pathway, theoretically, especially as a 4000 level. Um, it could be, you know, 
you know, like I said, you had five classes and you have one outlier. It could be that one outlier so that you don't have to worry about that. You kind of give yourself a four credit break. Um, so that's a, it's a good question, but you should also see when you look at those forms or those, um, those spreadsheets that it tells you how many credits it's coming in as as well. That's a really important number to look at because some typically APs come in at four credits, but some classes only come in at uh, three credits. So if that's the case, you know, all you need to know is that at some point you'll have to make up that one missing credit. Um, but again, that's why you get me so we can work together uh, to figure that out. Okay. Yep. Okay. So it was STSH 1000 and it was four credits. Perfect. Okay. So that's what I was thinking. That makes more sense to me. Um, so the STSH 1000 um, probably maybe won't be part of the pathway unless it gives you the option to do like an STSH elective, which you, you can see those on some of them. And the four credits is excellent because that means you have nothing to worry about. You can just kind of throw that into the Haas pile and then see how it all shakes out after you pick your first semester course. Awesome. All right, any other questions out there? Do I think that 19 credits is a lot to handle for the first semester? This is a really good question, um, and it might not surprise a few of you that I do get this question a lot. It really depends upon a few things. Um, so whenever you talk to me, whenever you ask me questions, I will always start with you are an individual, right? Um, and everyone kind of has their own skill sets and that's where answers will always start. Um, and also with the specific question, it really depends upon what those courses are. So, you know, if we're looking at the straight up schedule that we keep referring to with the calculus, the chemistry the, and the, the physics, um, you know, of course, those are going to it's going to be a tougher semester. It's definitely going to be a step up from high school in some ways. Um, but part of the reason in that is just because, you know, it's labs like it's labs. <laughs> And that's a really big part of your first year is working through those labs. Um, and it's they just take up a good chunk of your time during the day. So when you start building your mock schedules, you're going to see that. Um, and, you know, that's that's really, you know, one of the big things about that schedule that we pick. Um, you know, the other classes that we have on that schedule, like Engineering 1700 and the one credit exploratory courses, those aren't things that are going to weigh very heavily on your schedule. Um, they are, they're seminars and they're really there for the information that you're getting out of them. Of course, they'll have a little bit of homework. Um, I actually don't know if Engineering 17 has, Engineering 1700 has any homework other than what your final exam will be. Um, but you know, they're, they're, they're lighter, they're one credit courses. There are some one credit courses out there like Engineering 1200, your CAD class, that's a bit heavier, which is one reason why I, I'm perfectly happy to have you leave that to the spring uh, semester to give yourself a little bit of a chance to get your feet on the ground before you head into that. Um, but the one credits that we're looking at for the fall are very safe, light, nice classes. Um, and Haas is great because a lot of times, you know, the communication intensive ones are going to be intensive in communication, so a little bit more work. Um, but when you're coming right out of high school, you know, that's where you are. You know, you just left a schedule where you're balancing the math and science and you're balancing, you know, your history and your English. So this is a really good time to kind of take advantage of that transition where you're used to that kind of learning. Um, you know, if you wait a while to do that communication intensive, first of all, the longer you wait, the less useful it's going to be for you in college. Um, it'll still be useful, but less, maybe so. <laughs> um, but also, you you get yourself further away from that work that you've done in high school. Um, so it might end up being just a little bit more than, than you would expect uh, later down the road. Um, if you're worried about the schedule, um, definitely make an appointment with me and we can talk about it one on one. Um, and remember, you know, we talk about strategic planning, that drop deadline, that add deadline, that's part of it. So if you get into the spring semester or into the fall semester and you get those syllabus, you know, you might look at that and go, yeah, no, this is totally fine. I, I've got this, you know. Um, 
you might get in this semester and then realize you don't have it. And what we do is we look at dropping classes, right, to save the GPA and give yourself a little bit of a break. And that is okay. It's not quitting. It's strategic planning to get your feet under you. Um, you know, I there's many, many ways to approach a semester. I personally see a lot of students go into the schedule and many of them handle it very well. Um, so it all it all depends upon what you need. Um, so like I said, meet with me if you're a little worried. Good question though. I, I do get that one. Okay, so would you say it's better to stick to one intro course rather than dipping into two since you already have Engineering 1700? Um, I actually, surprisingly, there are always students who take a couple, actually. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is, so I will say baseline, with all of you going into Engineering 1700, you know you're going to get at least a little bit of information about each of these majors that you're interested in, right? So even if you don't take the material science um, intro course this fall, um, you're still going to meet materials faculty. Um, there's also nothing wrong with registering for more than one and starting with courses and then using that to help you decide if one of those is the right major for you or not. You might instinctually kind of feel it out and go, you know what, no, this isn't the major for me and you can drop it. Um, or, you know, you might realize that neither of them are that much of a time suck and you really, you really want to take them until the end of the semester and that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, I know engineering processes is one of those options for the fall semester. That is a really cool class. So if that's one of the classes you're considering, engineering processes actually has no homework. Um, you just go to a studio and you get your hands dirty and you build a metal train or a metal cannon. Um, so that's, that's actually a good time and it probably feels more like a club than a class. Of course, attendance is really important. It is a class, so you, you have to take it, um, be professional about it. Um, but for something like that, you know, it's, it's a good way to meet. I mean, engineering 17 or engineering 1300 engineering processes is going to have students from every single major in it, um, engineering major in it. So that's a good class if you want to meet students. From other majors and then you, you can talk to them about um, kind of why they chose the major they did and you might discover every engineering major has a personality so you might find a natural click by going into a class like uh, engineering processes um, so that's a good question okay anything else out there So what are some tips for choosing the right host pathway for students depending upon their major, i.e. BME? And is it required to take a host course in the first year if we are having trouble fitting it into our schedule? So good two-part question. Um, so advice for choosing the right host pathway. Um, so there's a couple ways that you can take this actually. So if you are someone who really wants to um, make sure that your Haas pathway is very complementary to the degree that you, you think you want to choose. There are definitely ways to do that. Um, you know, for BME, um, I mean, it depends upon what your interest is in BME, right? Because there's cognitive science, which is one way you could look at BME. And there's also like well-being, which is another way that you could think about uh, uh, being a BME. Um, so I would say... The first question you want to ask yourself is what is what is it that you're trying to get out of biomedical engineering, right? Um, you know, why are you even being drawn to that? And then there is very likely a Haas pathway that is going to um, echo your the sentiments that you have about it. Um, I also want to throw out there that there are some students who also, you know, it's less about matching their degree and more about I love art or I love music. Um, and that's that's how they pick their degree. And there's nothing wrong with either of those directions. You know, at the end of the day, you want to enjoy the classes you're taking, especially when it comes to your general education, right? When it comes to your Haas classes, because it is the bonus on your degree there. Um, and if you can use your Haas pathway to uh, kind of sell yourself to a recruiter, that's also really cool. And you can see easily that whether or not you're trying to complement your uh, your your major, or if you're trying to 
just take advantage of studying your hobbies, both of those are going to look really, you know, it's going to be seen positively in, in a recruiter's mind. Um, if you're having trouble uh, taking a Haas course, uh, you know, this happens. So this is where I say you really want to have that plan A, B, C, because you really want to be at at least 16 credits in your fall semester. Um, I would say if you're really, really having trouble, connect with me and let's see what we can look at together. Um, so there's no... So there's no official requirement that you take the Haas course in your first year. However, you have to take an IHSS course, the Haas inquiry, in your first year. Um, you will not be able to register for an IHSS course in, after your first year. There's actually a restriction on it because they do save those classes for the incoming first year students. Um, I think the only class that they opened up, the IHSS, for students who missed it last year is economics. So if economics doesn't sound exciting to you, we're going to want to make sure that we can fit um, the Haas inquiry into your first year. Um, other than that, yeah, there's, I mean, there's no specific requirement, but we'll probably want to do our best to get you into one. Um, so you and I can work together. We can totally team up on that. So just, just reach out. All right. Um, okay. I am planning to either minor or major in music along with engineering. Are there Haas courses that would meet a requirement in both? Yes, so actually music is in the school of Haas. So you can actually do a pathway in music. You can do a minor in music. Um, and the cool thing about that, like I said, you have your five Haas courses. Four of those courses are gonna be things that you could minor in. So you could take four music classes to minor in music, um, and very likely all of those requirements, your Haas inquiry, your communication intensive, they're going to be within that four. And if not, you have one extra class that you can, you can use to take care of those other requirements. Um, and, you know, that's kind of one of those things that I was saying before, like one of the one of the things you can do with your Haas is continue your hobbies. You know, we have um, we have Chinese, you know, if you're interested in taking a language, we do have music and we have very passionate students with their music. Um, we have art classes, so um, you can do all that. Of course, there's also like history and um, literature and writing. Um, there's there's a nice broad uh, selection of Haas courses. All right. Good questions. Any other questions? Just give you another minute to finish typing if anyone is. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna guess we're done with the questions. Um, so, like I said, I am here if you have any other things you want to talk about you know some of the stuff that i did bring up today you may realize that um it's better to ask me one-on-one -on -one, which is perfectly fine my calendar is open um we can meet and kind of discuss anything that's on your mind um but as for tonight i think we're good so uh it was nice hanging out with all of you even though i can't see you or hear your voices so i feel like i've just talked to myself for an hour but Either way, I hope it was helpful um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>